business of God as he develops us as women ministers is to conform us to the original image and the original image is the image of a son. Dr. Lucy Nanga, Senior Pastor Fountain Gate Church and Visionary Network of Women Ministers Kenya, Women of Grace and Lack Ladies and Deborah Company among others. Her passion is to empower women ministers. He said, I will put an enmity between you and them. That's where the battle is. You can still conceive a vision in your old age. God is in the business of renewing. And how does God renew? God renews by His voice. Join us as we receive the ministry of the world. I would like us to go back to the scripture, uh, Matthew 25, on the parable of the ten virgins. As I said, you know, this is a very important parable. This is a parable we all know. This is a parable many people have used to preach in the past, but God is giving us new light into his word. You see, the Bible says, in your light, we see light. In your light. That's why revelation is progressive. It's progressive. It is in God's word that we see light and because the word of God is a, is a lamp to my feet and a light to my pathway, it is in God's word that we see light, but that light gives us more light. The more light we see, the more light we shall see. Also, the Bible says, deep calls unto deep at the noise of the waterfall. And we know that the voice of the Lord is like the voice of many waters. And we know that, you know, as we go deeper into God's word, therefore we do understand. So I want us to read that scripture, and I'll say a few things before I tell you what I want to share on today. Amen. Matthew chapter 25 from verse 1. If they can project it, that's good. The kingdom of heaven, and as I've said, this is the kingdom of heaven, shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. So you notice there is the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven has, is likened to ten virgins. And as I told you, virgins are a picture of the church. Virgins are a picture of a believer. The only difference is found in uh, chapter 25, verse 2 and 3. You see there were ten virgins. They all were carrying their lamps. Now the Bible says five of them were wise and five were foolish, and that's the difference. Those who are wise took their lamps. Uh, those who are foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. And Pastor James is sharing on the oil. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. Amen. Verse 5. But while the bridegroom was delayed, and you remember I've explained extensively, and you can check in the scripture, the bridegroom represents Christ. The church is the bride of Christ. So these ten virgins are waiting for Christ. It was delayed. They all slumbered and slept. And at midnight, a cry was heard. That is why the Bible says he will come like a thief in the night. It is not relating to the night, by the way we know night, but it means he will come in a time that we do not expect. Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out and meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. Verse 8. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us and you. But go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who already went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he said, he answered and said, Assuredly, I said to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore. You can see this is, this is actually the heart of the matter. As I said before, Jesus was addressing his disciples. He was not addressing five people who are saved and five people who are unsaved. That is the way we have interpreted it in the past, and that's okay. It had its own use, and we have won many to Christ. But this context in which Jesus was speaking, he was speaking to his disciples, and he actually gives the message at verse 13. He says, Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. In other words, Jesus was trying to help them on how they can live when they are prepared. In other words, from verse 10, you can see 
uh, from verse 10, you can see, and while they, were, they went to buy, the bridegroom came and those who are ready. So it's about preparation. And what is that preparation? It's keeping your lamp alive. Just go to verse 9. It's being able to keep your lamp alive. But the wise sons are saying, no, lest there should not be enough for us and you, but go rather to those who sell and buy for yourself. Verse 8, uh, verse 8, uh, verse 8. And the foolish, yes, and the foolish said to the wise, give us some of your oil for our lamps are going out. So that is where the problem was. That, you know, they had lamps, but the lamps were going out because they lacked the oil. That means they were not ready. You remember the five foolish went without enough. The, the wise ones went with enough oil. And at a point when the bridegroom cry was heard, which is a, a reflection or a representation of the coming of Christ, the five of them did not have, and their lamps went out. So today I want us to share on how to keep our lamps burning, because that's what Jesus emphasized on in verse, in verse, uh, in verse uh, 13, or rather maybe how what keeps off our lamps is what I'll be sharing on. I already said, and uh, please refer to my teaching, that the lamp in this context, uh, Jesus was talking about our spirit. He was talking about keeping our spirits alive. Proverbs 25, verse 28, uh, Proverbs 20, sorry, verse 27, the Bible says, the, the spirit of man is the lamp of the Lord searching all the inner depths of his heart. Of course, we know the lamp also represents the word of God. The lamp represents the presence of God. The lamp is a symbol of worship and many others. But in this context of Matthew 25, Jesus was referring to their spirits, keeping their spirits alive. That is why they all slept and slumbered. That means physically they slept. And you know, the Lord will come maybe when we are uh, sleeping, at night, that is not the sleep that God is talking about. This sleep is a sleep of the spirit where the spirit is not alive. I told you last time, the functions of the spirit is, a, is, a, uh, is to have a con conscience or conscious. That is the designing organ. I told you the work of the spirit is intuition. That is the sensing organ. The work of the spirit is communion. That is the fellowship organ. And you must keep your spirit alive. Uh, the other thing that represents the spirit in the Bible, as I said, is the city. You know, I shared that a city also represents uh, your spirit. Uh, Proverbs 25, I'm repeating, verse 28, the Bible says, Whoever has no rule over his own spirit. And so we're talking about how to have rule, ruling, ruling, sorry, your own spirit. How to rule, how to govern. That word also means how to have control. In other words, self-control. That is why the Bible talks about the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. One of them is self-control. How to have self-control over your spirit. Because whoever has no rule over his own spirit is like a city broken down without walls. Whoever has no rule over his spirit. That's what I've told you means to have control. It means to govern your own spirit. All right? Also, Proverbs 16, verse 32, the Bible says, He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit. I wanted you to see the emphasis there, repeating again, that the spirit of man is, is the lamp of the Lord. So when the Bible talks about the lamps going out, in Matthew 25, which is a parable, and I told you a parable is a story that represents something else, is not a true occurrence, Jesus is referring to our spirits. And the key words in Proverbs 25 and Proverbs 16 is that we must be able to rule our spirit because it is in being able to rule our spirits, to govern them, that we are able to keep them alive. Your spirit is your city, and the city must be guarded. It must be kept alive. That is why also Jesus said, you are the light of the world. Matthew 5, verse 14, we'll refer to it again, but let's go there. Matthew 5, 14, the Bible says, 
you are the light of the world a city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket you can see again the lamp the city, and I've already shown you the other scriptures that shows you your, your city represents your spirit, or your spirit can be symbolized by a city. So Jesus said, you are the light of the world, verse 14. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lamp Stand. On a lampstand, we don't have much time to talk about the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So, those two key words, uh, those, that one key word, sorry, found in Proverbs 25 and Proverbs 16 is what I want to emphasize on. Whoever has no rule. So the key is being able to rule your spirit, govern your spirit, have self-control so that you can be able to keep that spirit alive. One of the places we see a lamp is Exodus 27, verse 20 to 21, and I'll read it. And also Leviticus 24, verse 1 to 3, will refer to them. Because the responsibility, as you've seen in both Proverbs um, those two scriptures I've referred to, Proverbs 25 and 16, it is whoever has no rule over his spirit. That means the responsibility of governing, ruling, tending your spirit is your responsibility. So, now we go back to the Old Testament because it's the type, it's a shadow that was to come. Exodus 27, the Bible says, and you shall command, this is Moses telling, uh, telling uh, this is God telling Moses, you shall command the children of Israel that they bring you pure oil of pressed olives for the light and refer to Pastor James' teaching on that to cause the lamp to burn continually. All right? So they were to bring oil so that it causes the lamp to burn continually. In the tabernacle of meeting, outside the veil, which is before the testimony, Aaron and his sons shall tend it from evening until morning before the Lord. It shall be a statute forever to their generations on behalf of the children of Israel. This light that was to continually burn was in the tabernacle of meeting. It was in the temple also. And that again we know the Bible says, don't you know that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit? Therefore we are the tabernacle and the Spirit of God lives in us. That spirit is the lamp we are talking about. But what I wanted you to see is that it was the responsibility of Aaron who was a priest. And in the New Testament we know we do not have priests and laymen we are all priests in God's house. Many people confuse between priesthood and the fivefold gifting. Those are two different things. In the New Testament, we are all priests. We can offer sacrifices. We can go beyond the veil. We can pray. We can do whatever the priest used to do in the Old Testament. Therefore, it is our responsibility, just like it was given to Aaron, to make sure that always the lamp is burning. The Bible says his sons shall tend it from evening until morning before the Lord. That means the responsibility of taking care of your spirit is your responsibility from morning to evening. And we say there are two ways to, to take care of that lamp. One is to make sure that the oil is flowing, the oil is the Holy Spirit, and that the wick, which is your spirit, is always trimmed. And I don't want to repeat that. Again, refer to my notes. In, in Leviticus chapter 24, verse 1 to 3, let me read it again, uh, just for emphasis. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, mm -hmm. Command the children of Israel that they bring to you pure oil of pressed olives for the light, to make the lamps burn continually outside the veil of the testimony, in the tabernacle of meeting. Aaron shall be in charge of it until, uh, from evening until morning before the Lord continually. It shall be a statute forever in your generations. What I wanted to emphasize is that he who has no rule over his spirit, Proverbs 16 and Proverbs 25, 
is like a city that has no war. And the responsibility of ruling, which means to govern, which means to control, in other words, to have self-control. But in addition, it means to restrain. Go and check out that word, the Hebrew word. It also means to he who is not able to restrain his spirit. So in many words, I'm trying to say the responsibility of guarding your spirit is your responsibility so that you can keep the fire, the lamp burning from morning to evening until to the next morning. That is your responsibility. Now, let's look at Luke chapter 11, verse 33. We like reading many scriptures. I learned, I've not preached for very long, but I learned, even when you have nothing much to preach, just read scriptures. They are self-explanatory most of the time. I'll read uh, Luke 11, verse 33, uh, from verse, <coughs> sorry, Luke 11, verse, verse 33. No one, no one, no one, when he has lit a lamp, puts it in a secret place or under a basket, but on a lamp stand that those who come in may see light. You remember what we read? You are the light of the world, a city set on a hill. Remember, just keep that in mind. The lamp of the body is the eye. Once again, to remind you, one other symbol of the spirit is the eye, because the lamp of the body is the eye. And when you read the scripture, you will say the seven uh, eyes of the spirit of God representing again the spirit. The eye also is a spirit. And when the Bible says the lamp of the body is the eye, it means your, your life is the brightness, the illumination from your life is largely dependent on the state of your spirit. Because, you know, our bodies can get worn off. You know, sometimes you get so tired. Our soul can get worn off. Sometimes emotionally you are drained and many things that happen to our soul and to our body. But if our spirit is alive, that is what radiates the light of God. Because our communion with God is not through the flesh, it's not through the soul, as important as they are, it is through the spirit. And that is why you find even when somebody is, is dying, it is only when they give up the ghost that they die. Nobody dies before they give up the ghost. Even Jesus. On the cross, the Bible says, he gave up the ghost. He gave up. That ghost is a spirit. It was his spirit. So your spirit is what radiates life from you. It doesn't matter the sickness you're going through. It doesn't matter the oppressions you're going through. It doesn't matter the emotional things you may be going through. If your spirit is strong, it's going to radiate life. It's going to illuminate your life uh, from your body. The lamp of the body is the eye. Therefore, when your eye is good, the other word for that eye is actually called single, when you have a single eye. And it's something we can go into, but because of time, let us not. Therefore, when your eye is good, when your spirit is good, your whole body is full of light. Saints, I want to encourage you. Take care more of your spirit, more than we care so much about the body. You see, the body worries about food, about clothing, about all those things that keep us very active in the day. You know, our souls want to be loved and all those things that are important. But what you need to be more keen on is your spirit because if your eye, which is your spirit, is good, your whole body also is full of light. But when your eye is bad or double, your body is full of darkness. So you, the state of your spirit is what determines who you were, not the things that you have or can acquire. Therefore, let us not be so bothered about what we have in the flesh, but more bothered about our spirit. That's why Jesus said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that is proceeding from the mouth of God. Because you remember, the word of God is what actually keeps your spirit. Verse 34 of Luke 11, the lamp of the body is the eye. Therefore, when your eye is good, your whole body also is full of light. But when your eye is bad, your body also is full of darkness. Therefore, therefore, take heed that the light which is in you is not darkness. Therefore, take heed that the light which is in you is not darkness. If then your whole body is full of light. Hallelujah. I love that. Having no dark part, the whole body will be full of light as when the bright shining of a lamp 
gives you light. I want to read it again, verse 36. If then your whole body is full of light, and what gives you light? The eye is the lamp of the body. Having no part dark, the whole body will be full of light. In other words, your whole self will be illuminated by your spirit. That is why from now on, tend your spirit. Forget about all the other things that we run for every day and night. Because if you can tend your spirit, if you can watch your spirit like Jesus said, it will give the light to the whole body as when the bright shining of a lamp gives you light. Hallelujah. Don't you love that scripture? Therefore, our aim is to keep our spirits alive, full of light, irrespective of the circumstances we are going through, irrespective of the darkness, because we are a city set on a hill, and we cannot be hidden. You know, Jesus talking to the, the, the church of Ephesus in Revelation 2, from verse 1 to 6, I want to read um, the Bible says that this thing says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. Again, you know he was referring to the church here. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not and have found them liars. Revelation 2 from verse 1 to 6. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. There, nevertheless, Jesus said, nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Don't worry, our scriptures are not coming alive, but that's okay. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, verse 5, repent and do the first work, or else, Jesus said, I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. That's a very serious thing. You know, Jesus is addressing this church through the revelation he gave to John, and he tells the people of Ephesus, he says, you know, even though you have this, you have that, but nevertheless, you have left your first love. And you know what was the first love of the Ephesians? You can go and study from the book of Acts. You can see what was the love of the Ephesians is that when Paul went to the, to, you know, went to the temples and then there was a riot he went to he went to the school of Tyrannus and he taught them he taught them there daily they had the word of God and therefore in relation to this it was really the love that they had for the word of God that had reduced but anyways the Bible says therefore remember therefore from where you have fallen repent and do the first works or else I'll come to you uh, to you and remove your lampstand from its place I pray that my lampstand will not be removed. And he says, unless you repent. Now, I just want to share with you quickly on the things that put off your lamp. Because your lamp, you know, can be put off. I just want to share with you a few things, just a few points, and the Lord will help us. Just the things you need to care for. The first thing I want to talk about is found in Job, uh, Job chapter 18. Job chapter 18, let me just get that scripture. I thought I had uh, quoted it, but uh, I don't have it. Um, just a minute. I think it's Job chapter 18, verse... Sorry. Please get it for me, but let me just read it. I forgot to write it. Job chapter 18, the Bible says... The light of the wicked indeed goes out. The light of the wicked is talking about wickedness. Those who have uh, a wicked, a wicked, a wicked, uh, uh, a wickedness, those who are wicked, their light goes off. The Bible says the light of the wicked is verse 5. The light of the wicked indeed goes out, and the flame of his fire does not shine. The light is dark in his tent, and his lamp beside him is put out. Let's read again from verse 5. The light of the wicked, the light which is given by your lamp, the light of the wicked indeed goes out, 
and the flame of his fire does not shine. The light is, darkness, is dark in his tent, and his lamp beside him is put out. That means any form of wickedness, any form of wickedness, any form of wickedness will put off your light. That is why we must endeavor to live a life that is in line with God's will. We have to deny, we have to refuse all manner of wickedness because any form of wickedness will put off your lamp. You see, the light of the wicked indeed goes out and the flame of his fire does not shine. The light is dark in his tent and his lamp beside him is put out. And there are so many forms of wickedness. That is why David will say, such my heart. You know, sometimes you think you're not. That's why David will pray, search my heart and see if there is anything wicked within me. Because sometimes we can judge ourselves and, you know, assume we are living holy, but yet God can't see any forms of wickedness. Wickedness, especially the heart. The Bible says the heart of man is desperately wicked. That is why we have to keep searching and guarding our hearts because our hearts are desperately wicked, is the Bible. It is, I think, Jeremiah who says the, the heart of man is desperately wicked. Who can know it? The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. That's the heart of man. Who can know it? That's why David will pray and say, search my heart and see if there is anything wicked in me. Because if you do not do that, then you are likely to be doing things that God is not interested in or is not happy about. So we have to do away with all manner of wickedness. We can nest through the heart. We can nest through the lips. Any types of um, perversion, you know, including sexual immorality, corrupt communication. If anything kills your spirit, if anything puts off your light, is wickedness. And I don't have time to labor in that, but just know, ask God tonight, Father, show me the wickedness of my heart. You know, David didn't realize the wickedness in his heart until he saw Bathsheba, you know, as uh, Bathsheba, sorry. Yes, as he was, he was, uh, she was in the, uh, you know, taking a, a bath. He didn't know the wickedness in his heart. The Bible says, you know, when kings go to battle, you know, David went on his rooftop and he saw this woman, you know, the wife of Uriah. And you can imagine the wickedness that this great king, the man with a heart after God's own heart. I mean, it was so much wickedness. He not only slept with that woman, he, he lied, he tricked the husband, and he tried to, you know, to confuse him. But, you know, because Uriah was faithful, his heart was right. He refused to do everything that David was saying because he was loyal to David. Can you imagine? He was among the most loyal people to David. He couldn't even go to his wife when the king asked him because of his loyalty. But look at David's wickedness that he was unaware of. He was unaware of his wickedness. That is why you can pray that prayer. See if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Because we can harbor a lot of wickedness. And you know, God had promised him that his lamp, you know, shall never be put off. In fact, when you study uh, uh, the, 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 the book of um, First Samuel and also uh, second, uh, first Kings and second, I mean, Kings and Chronicles, you'll find that David is referred to as the lamp of Israel. In fact, one day when he went into the battle and he became so weary, they said, you will never again go into battle lest the lamp of Israel be quenched out. So he was seen as the lamp of Israel by the people. He was a city set on a hill. But what almost destroyed him and removed the kingdom from him was the wickedness of his heart. That is why when he prays in Psalms uh, in Psalms chapter 51, he can say that, you know, restore unto me the joy of salvation and renew a right spirit. We can go there within me. So it was about his spirit. His spirit was almost put off because of wickedness. And this is wickedness I don't think he knew he had. 
you know, restore to me the joy of salvation and by uphold me by your generous spirit. Let's see. Um, Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. I want to read it. I think it's good. This was not in my whole note, but, you know. Create in me a clean heart because the issue of wickedness is a thing of the heart. I tell you, friends, like Jeremiah said, the potential of wickedness in me and is you, it is so much. The potential, the potential of wickedness in you and in me is so much. So David says in Psalms uh, 51, create in me a clean heart, O oh God. And please go to verse 10. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Remember, this is the psalm he sung after he had sinned against God. He slept with the wife of Uriah. He killed Uriah. Oh my God, I can't believe it. You know, he, after he realized Uriah was not going to change his mind because of his loyalty to him, he killed him. He, he told the people, the, he told Joab and all those leaders of his army, put him where the battle is hottest. And you know, even when the prophet came to him and gave him a story, another parable, it was a parable, you know, and he said, let that man die. And, now, and the prophet had to tell him, you are the man. It's only when he humbled himself. And I like this Psalms in Psalms 51. I want to read it, though we hadn't planned to, but let me read it from verse 1 because it is important. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. This is David. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me. In other words, he is talking about conviction. And you know, conviction is a role of the spirit. And you, against you only, I have sinned and done this evil in your sight that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. You know, saint, it's not what people know about us. It is what God knows about us. He says, behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth. Where? In the inward part. I also taught you the other, you know, what represents the spirit is the inner man. When the Bible talks about put on, you know, uh, your inner, in your inner man, that inner man is spirit. And in the hidden part, you will make me to know wisdom. Purge me with high soap and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear the joy of gladness. And many of you know that, you know, uh, joy, joy, the kingdom of God is uh, love, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. And that joy comes through the Holy Spirit. That the bones you have broken may rejoice. Verse 9, hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities, creating me, this is what I wanted you to see, a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Let's see what NIV says in this particular one. Verse 10, create in me a pure heart, O oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Let's see what message you say. God, make, me a, a, make a fresh start in me, shape a Genesis week from the chaos of my life. I think the others are much better. Anyways, what I wanted to say, he was more concerned with God giving him another spirit, a steadfast spirit. Verse 11 says, do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Why? Because if his spirit, his spirit, the other spirit, verse 10, go to verse 10, I show you. The other spirit he's talking here is his own spirit. You can see it's a small spirit. It's a smallest. Creating me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me so that now verse 11 do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Hallelujah. Verse 12 says, Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. What was I trying to say? Any form of wickedness, brethren, we must deal with it because why? Job chapter 18 verse 5 says, The light 
of the wicked indeed goes out and the flame of his fire does not shine. The light is dark in his tent and his lamp beside him is put out. And David knew this so much. Therefore he prayed that his lamp would go back. He is the lamp of Israel. He was seen as the lamp of Israel. You can actually give us that verse if you see it. That you know, lest the lamp of Israel be put off. He was seen as the lamp. He's the one who provided that light. But the day he allowed wickedness in his heart, then judgment came upon him. And he quickly had to pray the right prayer that God would bring a right spirit in him. Amen. So that his lamp would not go off. All right. The second thing that can bring, uh, can put off your lamp is how you deal with the brotherhood. How you deal with brotherhood, especially in relation to love. Especially in relation to love. If you have hatred to the brotherhood, then you will live in darkness. You live in darkness. First John chapter 3, verse 15, the Bible says, We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who, verse 14, he who does not love his brother abides in death. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life. Let me read it again. So I've talked about any manner of wickedness. I've given the story of David. Uh, we'll give you that verse in a, in a short while. He was a lamp of Israel, but his lamp almost went out because of the wickedness in his heart. And may the Lord help us tonight to deal with any form of wickedness. The second thing is how we treat the brotherhood, especially in relation to love. First John chapter 3 from verse 14, the Bible says, we know that we have passed from death to life. The light that is being uh, referred to here is not the life, the, no, the natural life. It's the eternal life that we experience. Let me tell you, he who believes in him has eternal life. In the previous past or in the previous move, we thought we will get eternal life at the end of the age. No, the life of God is in us. We already have eternal life. That's why the Bible says laying hold of eternal life. So we have eternal life now. Our bodies may die, but we have eternal life because we have the Christ who is eternal. So when the Bible says we know that we have passed from death to life, it's talking about the spiritual life that we have because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. And death means your spirit goes away and your light is not there. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer. And, no, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. So we must be very careful about how we relate with brethren. Because of the promise, I wanted to see this one in relation to David. Sorry, this just came to me as I preached, and it's okay. But Abishai, the son of Zuriah, Zuriah was his sister, came to his aid. We can read from verse uh, 15. Let's read from verse 15. When the Philistines were at war again with Israel, David and his servants with him went down and fought against the Philistines, and David grew faint. The Ishbi Benob, who was one of the sons of the giant, the weight of whose bronze spear was 300 shekels, who was bearing a new sword, thought he could kill David. I wanted to see what they say in verse 17. But Abishai, the son of Zuriah, that, that was the son of his sister Zuriah, came to his aid and struck the Philistines and killed him. Then the man of David said to him, swore to him, saying, you shall, you shall go out no more with us to battle, lest you quench the lamp of Israel. So he was seen as a lamp, but yet his lamp was almost put out. And you can study other scriptures where God promised him that his lamp will never go out. But his lamp almost went out because of wickedness. Let's go back now to the second point. What I'm trying to say is the love for the brethren. How we love the brethren. That is why the greatest uh, emphasis God will put about clothing our inner man is the Bible says, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. Your spirit, your spirit must learn how to love. You know, when people do wrong things to me, 
I will feel in my soul. I may not be happy. I may be angry, just like God gets angry, by the way he does. He only does not get angry forever. His anger is only for a moment, so we must be like him. But really, what anchors, what anchors, and I said that when I was teaching uh, during the elect ladies, I said, love is what anchors your spirit, while hope is what anchors your soul. That's why the Bible says, for the love of God have been poured to us by the Holy Spirit. So love is what actually anchors your spirit, stabilizes your spirit. That is why you must endeavor to love the brethren if you keep your love alive. So we must clothe ourselves with love. The third thing I want to talk about, because of time I only have a few minutes, what will put off your light is when you worship material things. When you worship material things. When you worship material things. Um, I want to read you uh, what Matthew, we'll go back to Matthew 6, chapter 22, and I show you something in relation to the lamp, which is very interesting. You know, I was, I've been teaching uh, the women of grace and showing them how to interpret scripture, and one of the things I've taught them is the context principle. And the context principle uh, requires that you look at a verse. When you look at a verse, you relate it to a passage. I hope they are there and they are happy. When you relate it to a passage, you relate it to the whole, uh, to the whole book. Then you look at, after you look at the whole book, you look at the Testament, and then you look at the entire Bible. So when you read something, you must always look at, especially the passages within that chapter. It's called the context principle. Now, we'll use that principle right now, and the women of grace, wherever you are, Type amen. Hallelujah. So Matthew chapter 6, verse 22 to 24, the Bible says, The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. And you remember we also saw this in Luke 11. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is new is darkness, how great is the darkness? But I want you to see verse 24. No one can serve. This just comes there. It's related to the previous verse. No one, this is called context. No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate one and love the other, or he will love one, or he will be loyal to one and despise the other. You cannot. Serve God and mammon. You cannot serve God and mammon. I wanted to show you in the context. In fact, if you want to read the whole context, let's start from verse 19. The women of grace, you must be very happy. Context principle is right here with us. 19, let's go to verse 19. The Bible says, do not, that's where it starts. Do not lay up for yourself treasures on the earth where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The lamp. So these verses are not just cluttered and thrown. It is in that context where you lay your treasure. And therefore it talks about the lamp of the body of the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body is full of light. He says that no one, verse 24, can serve two masters. So in keeping our lights, our lamp alive, we must be very careful about covetousness, the love of money. Worshipping material things. Let me give you another scripture that will uh, confirm what I'm saying. Proverbs 28, verse 22. We'll read it a few minutes. Proverbs 28, verse 22. The Bible says, a man with an evil eye. Again, an evil eye. The evil eye is not the evil eye we know. It's not this eye. It's a spiritual eye. Even those people we know that when they look at your children, they die. It's their spirit. It's not the physical eye. A man with an evil eye, you know, if your eye is good, your whole body is good, but if your eye is evil. So a man with an evil eye hastens after riches and does not consider that poverty will come upon him. A man with an evil eye. This does not mean that God wants us to be poor. Not at all. It is the state 
of his eye. It is the state of his spirit. It is why he wants the money. A man with an evil eye, an evil spirit, he stands after riches and does not consider that poverty will come upon him. That means that he stays to be in a hurry, especially, I will say this, I don't need to finish, in what makes you to do ungodly things in order to gain riches. When you do ungodly business, when you engage in ungodly things just for money, you have an evil eye because you are not waiting for the process. You know, we grow in process. We sow seeds, we water them, we wait for the harvest. But people who are in hasty in getting rich, then they will pierce themselves, as Paul will say, with many sorrows. I'll look at that verse. But what I wanted to show is to be hasty in getting riches is to be in a hurry, especially that which causes you to do ungodly things in order to acquire wealth quickly. In order to acquire wealth quickly. Look at what Paul will say, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6. I'll read it quickly. Now, godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we will carry out nothing. And having food and clothing, with this we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, and a snare, and into many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. You want to destroy your spirit? Be hasty. Be a person who is covetous. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves with many sorrows. That's why he says now in verse 17, command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, not to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us all rich, all things to enjoy. Let them do good. And I wanted to say the way to deal with covetousness, that hasty, the evil eye, the man who has an evil eye is hasty to get rich, is in this way. I'll give you some scriptures. Proverbs 22, verse 9. Instead of developing a covetous eye that destroys your spirit, like we've seen in the Matthew chapter 6, and also that proverb we have read, this is the spirit you should have. Proverbs 22, verse 9. He who has a generous eye, again there, a generous eye. Instead of an evil eye, hasting after riches, you have a generous eye. In other words, you see everything from the perspective of generosity. You develop a generous spirit. Because the spirit of God is called the generous spirit. You change your perspective. You see everything from a place of generosity. He who has a generous eye. So we refuse an evil eye in Proverbs 28 verse 2, and we receive tonight a generous eye. We'll be blessed, for he gives of his bread to the poor. You know, as you think about the things you need to do, think about impacting the kingdom of God. Think about being a distributor of the things that God has given you. Verse 25 of Proverbs 11, verse 25, we'll also say, Proverbs 11 verse 25, the Bible says, the generous soul will be made rich, and he who waters others will himself be watered. The final thing I want to say in that one minute I have, what can quench your spirit is also when you walk in dishonor. When you walk in dishonor, I don't have time to explain that, but the Bible says in Proverbs 20, verse 20. And remember Proverbs 20, verse 20, verse 27 is the one that talks about the lamp, the, the, the lamp of the Lord. The spirit of man is the lamp of the Lord. But let's go to verse 20. So it's in that context. The Bible says, he whoever curses his father or his mother and you know the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6, children obey your parents for this is in the Lord. So you have, you have fathers and mothers. This is not just your biological father or your biological father, mother, but those who have been put over your life are also included. Whoever curses his father or his mother, what will happen to him? His lamp will be put out in deep darkness. Let me show you another scripture. Proverbs 30. I love Proverbs. I read them a lot. Proverbs 30 verse 17. The eye that mocks his father and scorns obedience to his father to his mother, sorry. The ravens 
of the valley will pick it. What will it pick? The eye, the light, the lamp. The eye that mocks his father and scorns obedience to, your ma to the, his mother. The ravens of the valley will pick it and the young eagles will eat it. That eye that mocks the father. That is why we must in this season, as we keep our spirits alive, walk in the spirit of honor. Walk in the spirit of all. The Bible says that, you know, that we, uh, an elder is worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in doctrine, in the word and doctrine. They are worthy of double honor. So if you can honor your father and mother once, then those who labor in doctrine need to be honored twice. That's what the Bible says. But what I wanted to say is, those who dishonor, those who walk in the spirit of dishonor. And it's not just honoring fathers, it's also honoring the brotherhood. The Bible says, honor the king, honor the brotherhood, honor all men. Walking in the spirit of honor, in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. And I pray for you tonight as we close. May the Lord help you as you develop your spirit. I'd wanted to share a few more things on how we, you know, we keep ourselves, especially in this the season, you know, the Bible says, put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. You know, there is a garment, you clothe your spirit. You know, it's Isaiah who will say that, you know, Isaiah 61 verse 3 says to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise, 61 verse 3, for the spirit of heaviness. In this season, clothe your spirit with, 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 with the praise, joy. We must be rejoiced. Rejoice in the spirit, not in the flesh. Things in the flesh may not be okay, but we can remove that spirit of heaviness and on and on and on. The Lord will help us if we get another chance. Let us stop there. May the Lord help you. Please look at those things I have said today. Any form of wickedness will put off your lump. How you relate to the brethren, to the brotherhood, you walk in darkness, your spirit will not be alive. How we deal with the issues of money, covetousness, no one can serve two masters, and how we walk in the spirit of honor and the rest of the things we'll share next time. Lift up those hands as we worship them all. The Order of Deborah by Dr. Lucy Nganga, a book that intensively opens up the three-sided face of life and ministry function of a woman. That is the prophetic order, the governmental order, and the family order. To get your copy of the Order of Deborah, please call 0716-919-783. This book is also available at Keswick Bookshop, Textbook Center, and Amazon.com.